Today's podcast is brought to you by AdvertiseCast. AdvertiseCast is the simple way to grow your business or get your app, book, brand, or funding campaign noticed. AdvertiseCast.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode will explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past. We'll delve into the folklore of the times and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Season 1, Episode 8. If you've ever watched a Western, you know the five critical elements of a great Western movie. There has to be horses, there has to be gunplay, there has to be triumph over adversity, there has to be diversity, even though... Hollywood often got it wrong, they were always on the right track by acknowledging the many different races and faces that were building this great nation of immigrants. And there has to be whiskey. But whiskey has always been part of American history from the earliest days of the New World. From Pilgrims and Pocahontas to our great forefathers, men like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln, all had a hand in bringing American whiskey from its earliest traces in the new frontier into the burgeoning empire that it has become today. The fabric of America itself is so deeply stained with whiskey, it would be impossible to tell the story of this country without at least a shot, a wink, and a nod to whiskey. You simply can't ignore whiskey's role in the development of our country. And yet, I can't recall a single teacher that I had teaching me the truth about whiskey. And by ignoring the truth, we make room for myths and marketers to spin their clever yarns. On today's episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast, we're whiskey talking, or talking whiskey, with author Reed Mittenbuehler, and we'll look at the way he weaves whiskey into the fabric of our nation with his book titled Bourbon Empire, The Past and Future of America's Whiskey. Reed, thank you for being on the show today. It's truly an honor to have you here. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. Before we get started down these trails and tales of whiskey, I have to tell you that long before I was doing this podcast, I received a copy of your book as a gift from my lovely bride, Cheryl. And when the idea first came along to do this podcast thing, you were the first person I thought of to have on the show. Not only is the topic of bourbon very near and dear to me, But if I had known that whiskey was as much a part of American history, I might have paid more attention in school. (laughs) That's the highest praise. Your book is really remarkable in that you tie the history of bourbon to the development of our country. And along the way, you manage to debunk and demystify many of the marketing myths and legends that have sprung up around whiskey. How did you come to write this book and why whiskey? Yeah, you know, this book kind of, you know, writing it, it came out of a place of I was a whiskey geek, and this was over a decade ago, kind of early 2000s, before it was as popular as it is now. Um, but I got into it the same way people get into beer or wine, um, you know, kind of geeking out about it. And I was looking for a book, and there were a few out there, but those were primarily guides, you know, how it was made, you know, and then ratings. And I was looking more for, I was looking for that, but all those books kind of mention this illustrious history that whiskey has, you know, saying, oh, it kind of defines America in all these ways. And I I kind of started thinking, where's, you know, where's that book? A lot of them didn't really elaborate. And I'm a big fan of these books that take a symbol or a commodity, like a single thing and using them as a lens for American history or any kind of history, you know, so you can kind of see how a culture is reflected in this product and also how, you know, as a culture changes, it changes the product, and whiskey is a perfect example. I mean, it had an influence on the United States and its politics. You've got the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, the economics. It was a huge driver of taxes, which was then reflected 
corruption that you saw after the Civil War. And at the same time, as the nation's changing and becoming more industrial, you see the methods of production and whiskey changing. So these things kind of pushed and pulled on each other. So you get this picture of, of two things. You get a picture of a product and the industry around it and also the nation that produced it. And so I thought that would be the cool story. And then that's where the idea came from. Um, and I was really more interested in it that way, you know, the economics and the politics and the culture of it, than I was from the strictly culinary angle, which is where a lot of other whiskey books tend to go, you know, ratings and more instructional from a food perspective. So I was interested in sort of that other thing. So the book begins with the story of George Thorpe, a colonial settler at the Berkeley Hundred, or Berkeley Plantation, located near Jamestown along the banks of the James River. Who was George Thorpe? George Thorpe is such a fascinating character because he's one of these very early white settlers to America, just up the river from Jamestown. This is in the late 1600s. And another thing that really appealed to me about him is that we don't even know absolutely for sure what he was doing. You know, we know that he was making a kind of beer out of corn. He was using a native crop from America to produce this other kind of alcoholic beverage that Americans liked. And he had a still, and it stands to reason that he was using that. So he was experimenting widely. He had I don't know if I even put this in the book, but he was experimenting with grapes. You know, he was experimenting on finding substitutes, really, for the kind of beverages he had enjoyed back in England. But at the same time, he's tasked with improving relationships with Native Americans and, you know, this other kind of wider story. And I love the fact that it's kind of buried in myth and it's a little bit murky and we don't know for sure because that's a theme that comes up in the rest of the book about this product. A lot of marketing later on in the, in the game became substituted for telling, you know, this real story of an industry that many times has been one of the most corrupt industries in American history, but it gets kind of, gets kind of the soft focus treatment. It gets kind of glossy. And there's a lot of aspects of Thorpe's story that parallel that. So that's kind of why I wanted to use him. And it's a great way then to get into some of the, and get in early on about some of the technical details about making whiskey, you know, how he would have done it. Um, you know, there are some records from around that era, a little bit after that, just kind of show how whiskey is made. So I could open with this story of this guy who suffered this horrible death. You know, he was slaughtered by Native Americans um, when he was you know, trying to kind of liaise between them. Uh, but you also get to see how he's actually making this product using his still and some of the cultural reasons why they would have done that, not trusting drinking water fully. And even when you had good drinking water, you know, there was a cultural prejudice against it. Well, I'm not poor. Why would I drink water? You know, I can drink better things. Pocahontas also figures into this story. What's her connection to Thorpe? You know, at one point she was brought back to England and there were a few Native Americans who were brought back to England. You know, some of them were servants to the Englishmen who were colonizing the New World. And Thor, before he went out to Virginia in the, in the 16, early 1600s, you know, he had been elected to office. He was, you know, pretty high born. He was a very wealthy, landed, almost like an aristocrat. I don't know if he actually was titled, but he was a wealthy. He was a lawyer, and he had a servant boy um, back in England who had come from the New World and was part of that group of Native Americans who had been brought over. And that's kind of what piqued his interest in this place and in you know, helping these people. He had kind of a missionary impulse to him. And so part of that troop of people who were brought from England, his servant was part of that. And Pocahontas was also part of that. And that is where part of his early connection to Virginia and the colonies came from. So now we have Thorpe, Pocahontas, and the first Thanksgiving. But it's the real first Thanksgiving, which was in Virginia, wasn't it? A little part of his story and of the Berkeley Plantation, where he's at just up the river from Jamestown, was actually the site of the first Thanksgiving. And when Kennedy was president, John F. Kennedy, there was a presidential decree to kind of name, well, it was kind of acknowledged that, well, it wasn't necessarily Massachusetts where we had the first Thanksgiving. It was this other place you know, down in Virginia where maybe the, you know, and it's, we, we always have this tendency to want to rank things. Like who was first? Who was the absolute first? And, you know, my mind doesn't always like care about those definitive kind of statements as much as, as, you know, just kind of understanding or general path these things sometimes follow. 
But I love that story of, well, we have this accepted story of the first Thanksgiving of Plymouth Rock or whatever. But there was actually this other first Thanksgiving, and I thought that was a theme that you see reflected in the history of, of bourbon. We'll get to it later when we get to Kentucky with people imagining who the first distiller might have been, and these figures like Elijah Craig. And none of this stuff is true, but it creates a myth. And, and Amer- you know, we like to understand our history through these these myths, you know, it's kind of like that old proverb, you know, what's truer than the truth, the story, you know, and sometimes fictions can tell a story better. So while acknowledging the parts of this that aren't necessarily known for sure, you get to that idea of fictions sort of reflecting truths. And I thought that was thematically a good way to start the book. So Thorpe is really acting in what he believes is this grand humanitarian capacity. He's trying to civilize these savage Native Americans who see him and his people as a threat to their way of life. Thorpe and his cronies take them in and let them live amid their own families. He may even be sharing his booze with them. But things really didn't go so well for Thorpe. The Native Americans end up rebelling against them. And and Thorpe wasn't really necessarily a bad guy. Um, you know, he was trying to educate Native Americans. In a lot of cases, he was defending them. There were a lot of, you know, his fellow colonists were advocating for much, you know, worse treatment. But there still was kind of an arrogance in what he was doing, and that, well, we're basically going to convert that. You know, we will turn these Native Americans in, into, you know, many, many Englishmen or whatever. So there's that inherent arrogance that he had, although, you know, it was sort of coming. It would were easy to criticize this stuff today, but it was wasn't necessarily coming from a dark place in Thorpe. You know, he was a lot of times opposed to his fellow countrymen, but nevertheless, he suffered this horrible fate, possibly beheaded. No one really knows, you know, for sure. Drawn, you know, quartered during the Powhatan uprising of sixteen twenty two, I believe. Okay, so now we fast forward hundred and fifty years or so, and now we've got figures like George Washington. Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson getting involved in the story of American whiskey. Wait, I mean the American Revolution. What does swilling the planters with bumbo mean? Right. That's a a term used for a practice that was very common in the early history of the nation where you'd basically get voters drunk so that they would vote for you. Um, You know, and they'd have barrels of whiskey, these kind of early primitive juleps where you'd have, you know, whiskey with sugar dumped into it and sprigs of mint and tin cups. And, you know, in the book, I actually have the figures. I don't have them off the top of my head right now. But they would show, you know, exactly how much alcohol was being spent um, by political figures in order to, to get votes. And you see it connected to a lot of early followers. You know, James Madison early on, people were, you know, in Washington, Jefferson. And you'd see some of the founding fathers criticizing other founding fathers, you know, for not having enough of it. They're like, oh, well, the reason you lost is because you clearly didn't swill the planters with enough bumbo. You know, that was kind of the expression for this for this practice. And bumbo was referring specifically not to say to whiskey, but to kind of rum drink. And this happened before the US officially became you know, the United States during a lot of you know legal proceedings when rum was the primary beverage of the colonies. And rum was a way for the crown to tie together the great points of its empire. You've got, you know, rum is made very, in a very similar to whiskey, except it's made from molasses, sugar byproducts. And you've got sugar grown in the British-controlled West Indies. They've got a lot of manpower down there. But then you've got these industrial centers further up the coast in places like Boston. And I believe it was about 30% of all the trade going in and out of Boston Harbor prior to the American Revolution was related to the rum trade. They're converting what was basically an industrial waste product, you know, molasses, byproduct of you know, making sugar, into something that was worth a lot more money. They're converting it to a distilled spirit, which people are using, as we mentioned before, because they didn't always trust drinking water. Um, it was just part of the, the culture. And you've got this product, and it's a major part of the economy. But as you see the American Revolution kind of starting to, to you know, grow up, you've got the you know, taxes on sugar and all the other taxes that the British were leveraging against their colonies. Um, and that sort of marks 
in a way, the beginning of the end for Rome. Rome was still very popular in the United States after the revolution, but when the revolution starts, all those rum imports stop because they're coming from British controlled territories. You had a lot of smuggling and things like that, but that really cut rum. So you've got colonists looking for some kind of substitute and their eyes naturally fall on grain. You know, it's, and it's got that, it's got a patriotic flavor to it. It's grown in the United States. It's native to the country. You also, by this point, have a lot of Americans who are starting to migrate further west where it's harder to actually get the materials you're going to need for rum, the sugar products, which have to be imported. No, but they've got plenty of grain. They've got plenty of wood to burn under their stills. So you see this natural transition towards whiskey. And I think that today, you know, I thought about this a lot. Why not rum? Why doesn't rum have that mystique and that romance that whiskey does? Whiskey is a very romantic drink when we drink it. We like to quote poetry and we you know, sit by campfires and you know, smile and tell stories and jokes. And rum, you have that too. And rum has this mystique, but it's more of a Caribbean feel. I think to a lot of Americans, it feels foreign in a way. And certainly during the revolution, it was painted as a foreign drink. It had that whiff of colonial rule about it. Whiskey became the patriotic alternative. And I think when we drink it today, that partly goes into our enjoyment of it. You know, it's a symbol. Um, you know, we have a kind of fond memory. There's a nostalgia attached to it from this past and the beginning of our independence of the revolution. Whiskey has that feel. So that's part of the reason I think why we enjoy it so much. And we enjoyed it so much throughout history. Not to mention it is, it was a little cheaper. It was very plentiful and we had plenty of the supplies we needed to make it. It was very cheap. So this was also a way of monetizing grain that would otherwise go to waste. Right, exactly. And so People forget just how much Americans were drinking back then. If you go to the National Archives, they have an exhibit showing it. You know, by some estimates, five or six times more per capita than we drink today, just you know, creating this image of people just drinking all the time. Very, it was very, not necessarily drunk because they were drinking throughout the day and they had different habits around their drinking, but just drinking a lot. And as you move further west into the frontier, we get these farmers and whiskey was basically just a sideline to farming. It wasn't like today where we have brand names. You've got companies kind of attached to it and you've got specialists, people that's all they do is make whiskey. Back then it was, well, I'm a farmer and this is, you know, your place like Kentucky, you're producing five times more corn and other grains than you're really going to be eating. You don't have a way to ship these grains to market. You don't have canals. You don't have very good roads. So what do you do with all this excess? You can just let it on the ground, leave it on the ground to rot, or you can preserve it into whiskey, which as it sits in a wood barrel is getting better as it ages. Um, you know, it's a way to preserve value. And people would use it as currency. They're using it to trade. So they're not really using it entirely from you know, in a culinary sense to drink. They're using it as currency, which is something you know they had a hard time getting out on the frontier. So that's what people are using these, these spirits for. So it's not just whiskey for drinking, it's currency. It's an integral part of the American frontier economy, which, of course, interests the government for the purposes of taxation. After the revolution, Hamilton realizes that, well, we have to pay for this war we've just had, so we need to create a tax. So they create a tax on whiskey. It's kind of described as a luxury tax, which is something that people out on the frontier are rebelling. Well, it's not entirely a luxury. We're using this as currency. You're actually taxing our income. There's no income tax. You're taxing a thing that we're not using, you know, the way you're maybe suggesting we're using that. We're, we're using it in another way. But the tax he devised, which kind of ironically was taken from a similar tax that the British had had on, on spirits producers, favored larger, more consolidated producers on the East Coast over these smaller um, independent producers out on the frontier. These producers are basically just farming. It's a sideline to farming. They're not even doing it all year. Um, he was taxing their stills based on their capacity, whereas he's taxing these East Coast distillers based on exactly how much spirit they produce. So these frontier farmers could be taxed theoretically on something they weren't even producing. So clearly there's going to be a problem there. And they rise up in this rebellion, whiskey rebellion. And, you know, this... This, this confrontation. You know, they're threatening to secede. They have their own flag. Um, and you know, this happened around Pittsburgh, which at that time was pretty much you know, 
the frontier, far western Pennsylvania. I mean, you do have frontier a little bit beyond that, getting into Kentucky, but this is this is kind of where the line ends, right? <laughs> and so you've got this battle, basically, to, you know, the way I describe it in the book, to find the soul of American business. On one hand, you've got Alexander Hamilton, and he is an advocate for big business, larger consolidated producers. On the other hand, you've got Thomas Jefferson, who's the champion of these yeoman farmers who are making whiskey as a sideline, basically, to farming. And then you've got George Washington, who's kind of stuck in the middle. He's got both these guys whispering in his ear. You know, one side, Hamilton, is saying, you need to show that we're a strong nation, a strong central government, that we can't do this. And the other side, you know, he's got Jefferson and others saying, well, you know, these are Americans too, remember, and you know, maybe there's a legitimate beef here, and so it's kind of going back and forth. And he rides out, and it's funny because none of these guys, Jefferson, Hamilton, George Washington, particularly liked whiskey. You know, they were all fairly, you know, successful high boy, you know, they weren't, you know, of the land, I guess, as much as these farmers, you, you might say. Um, they would drink things like Madeira, imported goods, wine. Jefferson was a huge advocate for wine. I was just trying, he hated whiskey, although he was a champion of the people making whiskey. But as a product, you know, I thought it was rather, rather lowbrow. But Washington's advisors, as he's riding west, put down this rebellion. You know, in their diaries, they write, as we ride west into the land of whiskey, that is what we will be drinking. You know, to show solidarity with these people that they are about to... Uh, Kind of, you know, put down the rebellion. And I love the whiskey rebellion too because of the way we, we look at it today. It's got this, a lot of romantic overtones have been ascribed to this event. But when you really dig into history, and there's a great book about the history of just the rebellion by a writer named uh, William Hoagland. It's called The Whiskey Rebellion, which is, doesn't really look at the whiskey part of it. It looks at the politics surrounding it. And you can see today how much of that history has been sort of cherry-picked by different political groups, you know, to kind of tell a story um, or further a viewpoint, you know, not necessarily correctly. You see it a lot of times in the marketing. Uh, there's this story that the Kentucky industry, whiskey industry, would use in later years saying, well, you know, all of these fierce rebels, you know, once the rebellion was pushed down, decided to go further west. And they came here into Kentucky, you know, a land of, even more independence, even more kind of rebellious and fierce, where it was harder for the tax collectors to collect, which wasn't really true. Kentucky was already, well before the Whiskey Rebellion, starting to be settled and had plenty of people out there. But it's a way to give this product that they're making a flavor of something that's very romantic and that can be used for marketing purposes. So you see the history starting to be warped. You see with a couple of modern companies nowadays that have only been around for the last not even 10 years. Um, some, some smaller distillers out in Pennsylvania using figures from the Whiskey Rebellion who, when you really look at their history, weren't people you would, not, you would really naturally romanticize. Now, Philip Wiggle was a figure who, there were two men who were sentenced to death after the rebellion, and when Washington met them, he determined that one, you know, they were simple, one was insane. You know, like that's kind of, you know, he was like, I'm not going to hang these guys. You know, you want bloodless, but these are Americans and they've really sort of been duped by the forces above them. This wealthy, you know, wealthy, mouthy lawyer named David Bradford, who after the rebellion was put down, fled to parts of Spanish Louisiana. Yeah, but he had presented himself as the Robespierre of the West and he was talking about another French revolution. You know, the French revolution happening here in America to separate ourselves. And, you know, he had kind of hired some of these guys who were involved in the rebellion to basically, you know, commit arson against their neighbors who may not have wanted to rebel or, you know, steal the mail and do this kind of, you know, very low level um, kind of thug work. But you see these figures today romanticized as rebels. You know, it's almost in the way that, you know, it's, it's, it's romanticizing rebellion simply for the sake of rebellion. You know, like when you see someone wearing a, in the 90s when people were wearing Che Guevara t-shirts. And it's like, do you actually know anything about Che Guevara? It's kind of horrible in a lot of way. You know, it was very like, you know, talk to Cuban Americans and like, I cannot believe this man's face is on a t-shirt. The Whiskey Rebellion is portrayed as a band of rebellious outlaws trying to skirt taxation. But that's not what was really happening at all, was it? It's funny that the Whiskey Rebellion and the Tea Party are not taught as the same lesson in history. The Tea Party 
really, really latched on to the whiskey rebellion as a way to protest against taxes. It was seen as, oh, well, you know, these people were fighting the, the long arm of the government. They were fighting taxes. They were fighting this intrusive government behavior, whatever. I remember the commentator, Glenn Beck, actually started a, a denim company called 1791 Denim. When you look at the actual rebels themselves, a lot of them, there was one you named Herman Husband. There were a lot of voices that weren't arguing against taxes. It wasn't like, keep your hand out of, the, out, of, out of my pocket. It was just fair taxes. And then they wanted those taxes to be used for public funding of the arts and education and all these things, you know, that I don't think you necessarily see on one side of the political spectrum today. So I like to explain that a little bit in the book and the way we use the romantic slivers, you know, we kind of cherry pick these little romantic parts out of the history to create a whole different story in order to get to sell a product or move a, a, a certain political message. And you see it, you know, on all sides of politics today. It's how we handle history in general. But you see that rooted very much in this situation related to whiskey and related to this rebellion and this product and how this product is always given, handed these romantic overtones that have been used to sell it. Then when you get later on in the history today, you know, it's been fancified in a lot of ways too. Whereas the founding fathers looked at it as a very blue collar, you know, very low brow, very kind of, you know, if this is the drink of the parole. When Hamilton coined the term whiskey rebellion, it was a way to criticize what the whiskey rebels were protesting. They were protesting the Eastern establishment owning their other means, their other businesses too, like sawmills and things like that. It was like, oh, the whiskey rebellion. Whiskey was like a dirty word. Today, as we see this product fancified, it's kind of luxurified. We have lots of premium offerings and things like that. You know, those humble roots are something that the industry is also kind of, you know, in America, you can sort of use it for a kind of appeal, a kind of everyman appeal, but that also, in a way, kind of keeps them from charging as high a price as possible. Like, well, why would I, you know, for years it was like bourbon. That's just, it's just bourbon, it's just whiskey. Whereas scotch has always enjoyed a a more lofty reputation. And you can see bourbon makers in the 60s when they first starting to go into overseas markets, they would try to change that image entirely. Like Jim Beam, Jim Beam White Label, a fairly humble product. Um, they would advertise it in Europe with guys in top hats and white gloves holding platters of Jim Beam. It was very fancy, you know, because like no one really knew what it was. So like, well, why don't we give it an image that would correspond to a higher price tag? And you can see marketers today kind of trying to scrub just enough of those roots so that you know, and bring it more into that foodie kind of gourmet culinary realm that we enjoy today. Um, and so they can get a higher price for it. And that's the great subplot of this story. I also like to explore in the book was trying to take what really started as hillbilly juice that was in abundance and it was really cheap and everyone kind of looked down on it. And how do you change the image of it in order to justify a higher price so that you can make more money on it? Because at the end of the day, it is a business, right? It was a business when the rebels rose up during the Whiskey Rebellion, and it was very much a huge multi-billion dollar business today. So that, that DNA, that business DNA was something that I used as kind of an engine for this story. So even George Washington was a distiller himself. And this was news to me. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and as a kid, I was often herded onto buses and forced to visit Mount Vernon on numerous occasions. But I never knew or heard anything about this part of history. So George Washington was the biggest distiller in the country, and he's right before he died, distilling rye. And it was a huge operation. It was one of the most profitable parts of this plantation. Shortly after he died, it burnt down. It's kind of forgotten about it. I think a lot of people didn't even realize where the distillery is. If you go to Mount Vernon, it's a mile or two down there. I've been there several times. It's a great, it's a great trip. But people had sort of forgotten that this was part of his legacy. And then during the temperance movement and the run-up to Prohibition, when it was you know, this issue was charged politically, people tried to sort of remind people, even George Washington, the father of the country, was a distiller, and it was controversial, like, whoa, 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 you know, we're not going to remind people of, of that. Um, you know, the distillery had burnt down, it was quite literally under a pile of rubble and weeds, like, no one even knew where it was, and archaeologists rediscovered the site not that long, ago, just a couple, a few decades ago, and then it was rebuilt uh, using funds that were provided by Discus, the dis 
Dylan Spears Council of the United States, the industry's biggest lobby group. And you can see today, you know, they're reattaching it to that original legacy it has as being part of the nation's heritage for a lot of you know, political reasons, economic reasons, cult, you know, it's all, it's all sort of there. And sort of restoring it to what it was, but there was this period in the middle of American history where it was very much downplayed that Washington had any kind of connection to this thing. And despite the various economic forces influencing whiskey and its development, there's also a kind of organic evolution taking place. Immigrants are coming to America and they're bringing their own sense of values and craftsmanship to the art of making whiskey. But despite the improving quality, whiskey is still considered kind of a poor man's drink. Nowhere near in the same class as scotch or fine wine. That was another thing that really lent whiskey its its original reputation as being a humble thing, a fierce thing. A lot of people who were making it, you know, a lot of European, a lot of immigrants were making it. They all had, they all came from distilling backgrounds, no matter where they came from, Germany or you know, Ulster land, you know, which the Scotch Irish were really neither Scotch nor Irish, but they were over here. And these were, you know, they were fiercely independent. A lot of them had ended up in the hills, you know, living uh, away from the long arm of authority. Um, you know, they had been kind of repressed back when they were in Europe and they didn't want anything like that in the U S and U S provided an environment where they didn't have to be. And they were, they were scary people. They were living among you know, native Americans. These are the people who would occasionally roll in out of the hills dressed in coon skin, with these long rifles and, trade for some goods and you wouldn't see them again for a couple of years you know they could you know shoot a man between the eyes from a million yards i mean these were like really really fierce fierce people and that kind of legacy was attached to this was attached to this product so then there's this other thing happening as whiskey is morphing from this kind of frontier currency into a full-blown commodity and that turns out to play a pivotal role in the evolution of bourbon. And that is barrels. Barrels are so cool. Just everything about, like, the way they're made. And you know, they started originally as a transport device. And looking at their design, they, you know, it's perfect. You could roll them onto a big ship. You know, one single stevedore, about a 52, 53-gallon barrel. You can kind of handle it. You can pivot. It can go in all these different directions as you're, as you're rolling it. And for centuries, people had known that liquid stored inside barrels, especially charred barrels, you know, the charred barrel would have a positive effect on flavor. Wines, things like that are in the story. And it's going back many, many, many centuries. Um, but they started as a way to transport this product. But, you know, today it's just, it's an ingredient. And it's one of the most important ingredients in whiskey. If you talk to a lot of master distillers, arguably the most important ingredient. 50, 60, maybe 70% of the whiskey's final flavor comes from this barrel. And it's not just from the flavors the barrel adds. So barrels, you know, used for, for whiskey are toasted and charred. And you toast it, the sugars, the natural sugars in the wood um, are kind of cooked in, I think of like a, a toasted marshmallow, right? Those crunchy bits of sugar. And, you know, just the natural wood flavors too. You know, when we talk about wintergreen or baking spices or orange or whatever you're getting in your whiskey, you know, those kind of com chemical compounds there are, are, are shared in some with the vanilla flavor something comes from the vanilla. And then the layer of char helps filter impurities um, in the whiskey. So as the whiskey's sitting there aging, you know, and the weather is getting hot and it's getting cold, the whiskey is moving a little bit in and out of the wood. So that if you cut these barrels and you look at the wood, you can see a mark, kind of like the high water mark on the riverbed where the whiskey kind of soaked in and then it pulled these flavors out. But that's only one part of the process is the additive part where it's getting those flavors. You also have oxygenation going in, a little bit of air is coming in, you know, not perfectly airtight. And that's being dissolved into the whiskey and you've got esterification. And as the oxygen is dissolving and as some of it's you know, leaving the barrel, you have these flavors developing. You have these molecule chains that are being broken down, and then they're reconfiguring. And over time, that's how the flavors develop. That kind of gets back to my beef sometimes with these small barrels. Is it does that one thing. It adds those flavors, but it's short-changing a lot of times. The esterification, the oxygenate, you know, there's other factors that the barrel does. Um, they all kind of are balanced against each other. You know, or time is a very important part of the equation. Just, you know, there's a serendipity to the, the 53 
gallon barrel sort of being in a lot of ways ideal, really anything above a 30, you know, that it allows all these things to develop, you know, so you don't lose too much to evaporation by the time you know, those other things happen. You know, so they started as this transportation vehicle, you're just, you know, putting a barrel on a ship or wherever and you're shipping it that way. And people would notice that over time, you know, this whiskey, it, it's tasting better the longer it, it sits. And there's a sweet spot, you know, if it sits too long, it can get too woody, you lose too much evaporation. You know, if you've, there are some really old whiskeys out there, you know, they're more rare and we tend to glorify them simply because they're old, but some of them can get pretty nasty. I love hearing stories from old distillers about stuff that was sold in the 70s and 80s to a Japanese market that loved, you know, whiskey, but they're taking all their rules from the Scotch world where whiskeys, because of the differences I get into in the book, can age typically a lot longer. The Americans were like, oh, we sold some of the worst crap, stuff that you know, should have been redistilled into just industrial alcohol. American whiskey is reaching kind of a tipping point here now. With whiskey being produced in large quantities, at least large enough to warrant storage in barrels, and then it's being shipped from distilleries. It's still not being called bourbon, though, is it? What's happening to all these barrels of booze? So back on the frontier, you know, you've got this case of New Orleans is a big market for Western whiskey, what we're calling Western whiskey. At that point, it wasn't called bourbon yet. And you would have a lot of, a lot of French settlers around Louisville. You know, you've got Louisville, that's a, a French name. Shipping Port is an area uh, near the falls of Kentucky. And the name bourbon even kind of came, you know, no one really knows for sure exactly where it came from, but you did have a lot of counties in the front, places in the frontier, these French names, kind of as a way to say thank you to the French for funding American troops during the revolution to fight the British, who was also their enemy. They've got this big French-speaking population down in New Orleans. Um, some of them French. You've got Haitians who had fled there from a revolt. And, you know, you get this whiskey from the West as it's traveling down this river, sitting in these barrels, aging a little bit. You see a lot of the commodities, as I looked at old trade data from the 1800s, and you see a lot of commodities coming out of the West, and they would hit New Orleans as a port, and then they would move on to the East Coast. You know, that was, you, know, you couldn't ship it east over the land. You had to take it out of New Orleans and just sail it up. But the one product, one of the few products that really, once it hit New Orleans, and then just didn't tend to slip through, was whiskey. They were drinking an incredible amount of it. And, you know, the word Bourbon, it's just a beautiful word, right? It kind of reminds you of the taste of the spirit itself. It's got a lot of vowels. It's kind of warm and round, and it's kind of bubbly. And you've got a lot of whiskey at that time. It's treated like a commodity. You don't have brand names. So you've got a lot of whiskey at that time. Referred to, you know, maybe by the name of the town where it came from. Loretto whiskey or whatever. But then you start seeing people referring to different styles. Monongahela, you know, some rye, Pennsylvania, or, the, or this bourbon. And... You know, in a lot of ways, bourbon was kind of a marketing to it. It came up, it was, you know, not for a name brand, but for a style of whiskey. You know, coming out of the West, the Ohio River Valley, Indiana, Kentucky, Illinois, Ohio. And it would appeal to these Southerners in New Orleans, which is a French-speaking place. Um, it also would appeal to people in Louisville. So you kind of get this connection, you know, with the French, with this name, and it you know, kind of comes up as a way to differentiate this style that was sort of standing out, you know, for its quality, for the fact that it's made a little bit better because it's being aged just a little bit longer. Maybe not very long by today's standard, maybe only six months to a year, you know, not for, but still that a, a lot, a lot happens in that first year. You know, if you taste white dog, you know, on whiskey, if you taste bourbon that's, you know, a year or two old, it's night, days, even with that short amount of time. So this brings up an interesting point for whiskey enthusiasts interested in learning about the craft and culinary aspects of enjoying fine whiskeys and bourbons, and that is that you can buy some early or unaged whiskey products even today. Every once in a while, those unaged whiskeys can be kind of special. You can get some real, I talk about one at the end of the book. Um, yeah, there's a reason why it's, it's aged. You know, that's a lot of complexity and sophisticated flavor kind of comes from that process. It's an important part of it. You know, it's, I kind of think of unaged whiskey the way I think of it, you know, raw meat. You know, there's some raw meat to eat, sushi, and steak tartare, but typically you want it cooked. You don't always want it cooked super long, you know, but you want to find that sweet spot. The Drift and Ramble podcast will continue after this. <laughs> 
Are you a podcaster looking for an easy way to attract new advertisers to your podcast? At AdvertiseCast.com, we have created a simplified service that allows podcasters to sell ad space on their show. How does it work? Just set up your free podcast profile at AdvertiseCast.com. Then, it's published to our marketplace, where hundreds of advertisers shop for ad spots and podcast opportunities. It's totally free to add your listing. We earn a percentage of every order made by the advertiser. You keep 80% of the total sale, while we earn 20% to cover our operating costs. We also facilitate all payments and payouts and cover all credit card processing fees so you can stay focused on creating great podcasts. All it takes is just five minutes to add your listing. Drift and Ramble listeners, simply visit AdvertiseCast.com slash Drift. Once again, that's AdvertiseCast.com slash Drift. You're listening to the Drift and Ramble podcast, true stories and American legends. In the book, which for anyone who may be joining us late is called Bourbon Empire, The Past and Future of America's Whiskey, We're talking with author Reed Mittenbuehler about the history and evolution of America's native spirit. Reed, we were talking about the aging process, and in the book you compare aging whiskey to cooking barbecue, saying that slow and low is the way to go. Yeah, which from a philosophical perspective I love. It brings up this idea, there's this patience involved that I think parallels the best way whiskey is enjoyed, you know, where you're sitting outside, maybe on a front porch, you've got an old friend, your iPhones are off or maybe in another room and you're just out there having a conversation and you're just enjoying the place you are and you're not rushed. And, you know, I drew that parallel between some of the modern attempts we're seeing to try to age whiskey faster where it's like, well, you know, some of these traditions have become traditions for good reason. Um, And you do see whiskey being, you know, some of these new fangled aging techniques, people appropriating the language of Silicon Valley, oh, we're disrupting, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, well, you know, not everything has to be Silicon Valley. So if we're following a timeline for this evolution of whiskey, we're now around the early 1800s, maybe 1825 or 1830 or so, and we've become kind of a nation of drunks. We're drinking pretty heavily much more so than we do as a nation by today's standards. And our reputation for drunkenness is beginning to get some international acclaim. One of the things I love about reading foreign uh, interpretations of a culture, it's like the way that the French, like Tocqueville and these people, observe these things about Americans, that Americans weren't really going to observe about themselves because you're too close to it. And then on the flip side of that, you've got Mark Twain, you in Innocence Abroad, going through Europe and making all these these great observations about Europeans that they're probably never going to make about themselves. And one of the things that almost every single European traveling through America in the first half of the 19th century is noticing about Americans is how much they drank, making all these comments, just stinking drunk. My favorite is um, Trollope, you know, in her Domestic Manners of Americans. It's a wonderful book and still reads very seems very relevant. I, it's like she notices things about Americans that still kind of sit through today, kind of our tendency to, you know, she notices things about the national culture. And to illustrate, you know, points about the American character, she's oftentimes talking about the drinking and the drinking in saloons or drinking at the grocery and drinking attached to politics where drinking was seen as a way, almost as a way you were staying in touch with politics by going to the store where you're drinking out in front of the store or whatever and passing, you know, pamphlets and papers back and forth. But she's also noticing um, a kind of loneliness of Americans. And at this time in the first half of the 19th century, people living on the, on the frontier, um, this is one of the loneliest times in American history. If you look at population density and you look at the patterns of settlement out West, how many people were living per square mile, you had a lot of very, very lonely Americans you have people who, it was really this cyclical land trading cycle where people are getting land, and that could have been through a government grant or whatever, cheap land. And then they're selling that land, hopefully for a profit, and they're moving west. So they don't really have time to put down roots. They don't have time to build these social institutions, you know, like a city government or church or whatever, you know, to create a community and create a bond. They're all, you know, keep moving west. And that's something that a lot of historians – 
Um, Richard Hofstadter in The Age of Reform does a really good job of kind of looking at, at that in American culture. Also, um, these foreign visitors are noticing this tendency, the loneliness, the kind of alienation of a lot of Americans, and then they're noticing how much they drink. There's a historian who, part of his dissertation, what he calls the Alcoholic Republic, he turned his dissertation, PhD dissertation into a book. And he's looking at American drinking patterns, and he had an observation in there about a lot of societies, especially Western societies, before they industrialized, experienced great bouts of drunkenness. And this happened in Sweden. This happened in the UK. It certainly happened in America. As a society is sort of converting, and you have people moving from farms, you know, to these more industrial sectors, you, had, you tend to have these big surpluses of grain. With all that surplus grain, what do you do to it? You distill it. But then you have a big surplus of booze, and it's really cheap. So here, on hand, you have a very cheap surplus of a depressant. And it kind of feeds into all these observations that a lot of these foreign visitors to the United States are noticing. And that really is the genesis of the temperance movement, because there are a lot of problems that slithered out of that, a lot of domestic abuse, a lot of violence, you know, drunkenness. And that is the first sort of, you know, as a kid growing up, I remember thinking like, oh, we weren't a heavy drinking. I remember like all the hearing stories about prohibition, like we must have never been a very heavy drinking nation. So it was always like surprising to me, you know, years ago, but to really start first learning how much Americans really did drink. Like all that I would think of as American's history with booze, like prohibition, was really a reaction to the fact that we were one of the heaviest drinking nations on the planet, according to the data that is available from the time. We drank more than Russia. We drank more than all these places. And I think Sweden had us beat. <laughs> it's very interesting to look at the history of booze and see American life reflected through it that way. It's really pretty funny and almost shocking because. As a kid, the rumors and jokes I was told were always about other countries out drinking Americans. The stereotypes were the hard drinking Irish and their whiskey, the French and their wine, or the Russians and their vodka. But as it turns out, we were the biggest drinkers of all. Yeah, Americans in the 19th century were, it was, in the, in the words of that historian Rohrbach, Americans drank from the break of dawn till the break of dawn. <laughs> I'm so proud of my American heritage right now. And this is the perfect dovetail into another significant uprising that was also developing, which was the temperance movement. So fast forward to around the time of the Civil War. No one from the liquor industry seems to be paying any attention to this burgeoning backlash to booze. But there is definitely a battle brewing, if you'll pardon the pun, between liquor and beer. Right. So... The whole alcohol industry was balkanized in a way you wouldn't, I don't, I suspect you wouldn't see today, where distillers were very adversarial with brewers. Um, you know, they saw themselves, and there were a lot of cultural differences between people who were brewing and distilling, um, you know, the kind of backgrounds of people in those respective fields. And as temperance begins to harden into prohibition, for a long time it wasn't really about outright prohibition, it was about just you know, temperance, you know, responsible drinking, that kind of thing, drinking less. You know, there was this sort of prejudice that began, uh, there always was, but that really began to harden against people who made their money this way. And you would see a lot of prominent distillers in local business registries weren't necessarily listed as distillers. They were still, they would list themselves as farmers, you know, things that would sort of create a bear in old family diary, you know, families that made a lot of money on booze, you would really see it in the family memoirs. They wouldn't really talk about it. It was always something that was kind of swept under the rug. And so, you know, without being very public about it and kind of hiding their, you know, the, the sources of their fortunes, as temperance turning into prohibition starts to blossom, you see a lot of distillers who sort of fail to step forward to fight it because you wouldn't necessarily want to identify yourself as a liquor man. And you also have a fight that is becoming, you know, the fight for prohibition, beer positioning itself as a temperance beverage because it's not quite as alcoholic. You know, and you see 
these German immigrants, and they're drinking it in beer halls, and families are at these, you know, beer gardens and things like that. And so it was easier to promote, whereas whiskey is something that's in saloons, and saloons are nasty places, and people would go you know, to drink off their troubles and go home and beat their families and, and things like that. And so beer was effectively trying to throw whiskey under the bus. They would point at whiskey as being this nasty, you know, this drink of debauchery and things like that. And so they're sort of lobbying it. So you've got the alcohol industry trying to destroy it. So temperance people didn't like beer or whiskey. So the liquor industry is almost doing the job in a way of the temperance advocates, you know, kind of sniping at each other. And no one from the whiskey industry really steps out. And I did find, I was going through some family records of some prominent Kentucky distillers. And you do see after the cry for prohibition had reached this sort of gale force winds, they finally start to say, hmm, Maybe we should do something about this. Uh, Peter Lee Atherton, who's a prominent Kentucky distiller, talking to his friend, uh, he was a former congressman and newspaper man, Waterston, saying, maybe we should do public projects and we should build public, we should do these things that present, uh, you know, we should give back some of this money to sort of improve our image because these these men have horrible images and the industry was very corrupt back then. You've got the whiskey ring scandal of the Grant administration using funds that have been siphoned off of taxes to sort of buy elections and very political opponents and a horrible reputation as an industry. Like, well, maybe we should do things to clean ourselves up. By that point, the grassroots movement of prohibition, which really did set the template for all of these single issue grassroots movements that have followed ever since then, as far as how they, they lobbied, um, was already, you know, reaching this momentum that was going to be very hard to stop. And so, you know, the liquor people, it was a very feeble, attempt to fight this thing. And a lot of them didn't really think, I thought, oh, this is lunacy, it'll never pass. Because this is the days before the income tax. And liquor at this point is providing almost half, not quite half, you know, and it, it depended on what year you look at, but a huge amount of federal revenue, up to 40%. There's no way the government is going to cut their purse strings, these guys are saying. But then in 1913, just a little bit before you get to prohibition, you've got the income tax, which is passed. Well, now you don't have quite as much of a need for liquor revenue. You're starting to get, as the government should, you know, a more diversified tax base. And, you know, that was you know, one of the many things that helped kind of tee this, this amendment from going into place. So, you know, they kind of got caught a day late and a dollar short a little bit. Reed, I want to back up before we move on here to ask a question I know many of our listeners and fans of old westerns are probably wondering about, and that is, whiskey as it really was in the West. We always see these tough hombres and outlaws sauntering through the swinging doors of a saloon only to step up to the bar and order a shot of whiskey, then gulp it down. What was that whiskey really like to drink? Well, they might have been chugging it down, but what they were chugging down wasn't, you know what we enjoy today, you know, certainly you've got this industry after the civil war and this is when it starts taking on its modern day form. You know, this is when it's less just a sideline to farming. That certainly still existed, but you're starting to see people who are focusing specifically in the production of alcohol distiller and distillers look kind of like sawmills. And that was, you know, you focused on that much more industrial, much larger, bigger processes. And you've got, this huge part of the industry called rectifying. And rectifying is not necessarily a bad thing. It's for people who buy whiskey from wholesalers and market it as their own. And you can do that in a quality way or you can do that in a non-quality way. But the industry is almost entirely unregulated. Um, trademark law, you know, this is sort of the beginning of brand names in America before a lot of brand names. So trademarks, trademark and copyright law are kind of in their infancy and they're not very strong. And you have a lot of producers and you don't have um, good regulations dictating how people should label. You know, you just need to label honestly. But you have a lot of people labeling dishonestly. So you've got a lot of producers who are producing basically what would be considered vodka, you know, like, like a very pure, neutral kind of spirit. But then they might be, they might not be making it well. I mean, there might be a lot of uh, video. You know, the heads and the tails of, of their cuts are getting into the, the spirit. But also they're adding things to mimic the effects of quality aging. They're aging dye, you know, adding dyes, they're adding burnt sugar. Um, and some of those things are harmless, but they're also adding a lot of chemicals, carbolic, you know, adding acids, and things like things you don't want to eat, things that the FDA today would never approve going to anything. 
and you know to mimic the effects of aging. And so a lot of that is being sold, but it's being sold under labels that are entirely misrepresenting it. We had a few producers during this time who were making a very high quality product. The one I use in the book is E.H. Taylor. You still see Taylor to you know old Taylor. He did make a good product, and he's marketing this product and putting his name on it. He's very proud of it. This is supposed to be a sign of quality. But then you'd have producers who see his brands doing really well, like Old Taylor, and they're like, oh, let's copy the label <laughs> and sell their own product. But, you know, they'd say Kentucky whiskey, you know, aged 10 years. No word on that is true. It's being made in Peoria, Illinois, and it's added with stuff from, you know, it's all being doctored up by, by middlemen and wholesalers. So you really have no idea what you're getting. And people started to lobby for change, you know, some, you know, the, there were big lobbying debates between these two sides of the industry and the, the, the more nefarious, it actually had a lot more pull, a lot more weight because it was a lot more profitable. So you did have you know, states like Kentucky, which today have a great reputation, but a lot of producers in Kentucky were pushing uh, to declaw the regulations because they're making a lot of money selling this swill. But the right, the right sides of that battle ultimately won out, um, you know, you had a few regulations like the 1897 Bottled Bond Act, and then in 1906 you've got the Pure Food Drug Act, a you know, landmark reform that you know Fred Roosevelt. You have the Taft Act several years after that, which these are all basically labeling laws. You couldn't sell something that was misrepresented, um, and it creates an important lesson today too. You know, because sometimes you'll see certain labeling regulations being challenged by some new producers and it's a reminder of how bad it could actually be when you don't have these things in place and you don't have government offices sort of watchdogging and just making sure there's always that temptation to slide and to represent and sell a product that no one should really be drinking. So you got to the West, especially in some of the you know places that weren't even states yet, they're just territories where there are no rules, no, you know, it's just, it's kind of, it's relatively lawless. And some of the stuff you could get in a saloon was, yeah, you know, it had these great nicknames. Like my favorite is coffin varnish, you know, or tangle egg or tarantula juice. There's a whole host of these names that get into a book for some of the stuff you were getting out there. In a way it kind of mimics the old West itself. You know, it's this kind of lolly, you know, some violent, you know, there's a picture I use in that there's a photo insert in the book. And it was for, you know, when this brand Bowers, and it shows an old West gunslinger and it shows a Chinese man who, you know, of the style of someone who's you know, building the railroads. And then it shows a Native American and you see the gunslinger, you know, pulling out his gun to shoot these guys in the head and they're playing a game of poker on a blanket out in the desert. And then behind them, there's a saloon advertising this guy's brands of whiskeys. And that's the image he chooses to use to sell his whiskey. It's, uh, it makes it look like a very, you know, nostalgia is a powerful force. I mean, we like to nostalgize these places, but in many cases they're violent. You really would want to live there. I like to joke in the book, you want frontier whiskey about as much as you want frontier medical care. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice it to say, much of the whiskey that was available in the West and during the Civil War was pretty awful. And while the Confederates bore the brunt of bad quality booze, Union soldiers drank pretty well especially Ulysses S. Grant, who drank better than most, or at least more frequently. There's even a rumor he was stationed in Kentucky for a time to be close to the source of his favorite bourbon. But like many of these widely accepted as fact, but not necessarily true stories surrounding bourbon, there were some actual medicinal uses for the stuff. However, what we think we know about whiskey and those brutal Civil War surgeons isn't actually true. Whiskey was, and is, bad medicine before any surgery. And while most battlefield doctors are aware that whiskey opens blood vessels and encouraged patients to bleed out, Hollywood would have us believe that just a couple of snorts would make a man immune to the laborious removal of your leg with a crude hacksaw. But whiskey's place in medicine in the Civil War was still pretty gruesome, wasn't it? So whiskey was... Definitely misused in a lot of ways. I went, when I was doing book research, I went to, there's a museum in Silver Spring, Maryland, the Army Medical History Museum. It's a great museum. And you can, yeah, I was going through these old books from the Civil War showing um, some of these medical, treat, you know, medical treatments used during the war. 
and you had a lot of spirit, you know, whiskey and you know, spirits and other things, you know, mixed together and they're being served. Whiskey was seen as a stimulant. Well, we know today it's obviously a depressant, but it was seen as a stimulant. Oh, this is something we should use to you know, stimulate people. So you kind of see it misused in a lot of ways. You know, what, would have been a good way to use whiskey. Unfortunately, I didn't use it this way. It would have been as an anesthetic, you know, rubbing it on a wound or something able for you. Um, not a lot of evidence that they were actually doing that. A lot of doctors did know better than to use it for some of the practices it's ascribed to, like giving it to people before, you know, undergoing certain kind of surgeries. But some doctors have to realize too that the field of medicine was still pretty rough. Surgeons oftentimes are seen as butchers. And I talked to a few of the staff at the museum, a couple anthropologists and, and scientists who work there. And they, we just kind of walked through it for an afternoon. And I, I like kind of recounting out the book, all the ways that, you know, whiskey was used inappropriately on the battlefield. And I remember using the story of Dr. Britton. He was a uh, Philadelphia surgeon. So like he's a pretty good, you know, surgeon, but he used it as a preservative because he was tasked with the job of finding body parts that have been lost in battle and he was using them to study better medical procedures so they want these things preserved and he would hear a story about some weird wound or some soldier who had suffered some weird wound and he's going out to the battlefield and his staff is going out to the battlefield and he's at some points you know sloshing through these pits of human meat you know trying to find asking soldiers like where would that be you know you've got the doctor's tents you know, where they've thrown off all these amputated limbs. And he's in some cases going, he describes it in his mouth. I was reading through his memoirs. He's describing it, this awful thing, um, to try to find these. And he's preserving them. And then they're looking at the bone and they're looking at infection and they're using it for study. You know, he's trying to advance medicine. So he's doing a lot of good. And he was tasked with starting the original version of this medicine that I, that I toured through. And when you go through it, you see all these bone fragments and things, but all these were originally preserved with whiskey. And he was, you know, in Washington, D.C., that's where the original museum was, and they would seize whiskey, uh, seize any kind of alcohol. And they had a big still operating behind the, the hospital that they would throw old wine, any kind of alcohol that had been confiscated, and they're distilling it down into a higher proof spirit that they would then use to travel with these Things. The most famous specimen they have is they do have the leg of General Dan Sickles, who had been a Tammany Hall politician. It's a great story. The Tammany Hall politician who um, later became a congressman. He'd been a congressman, and then he became one again, and he had had a, a horrible debacle at, at Fort George. You know, he had defied the orders at Gettysburg of his boss, who was George Meade. A lot of his men were killed. He got his own leg blown off, but he had preserved it in this in whiskey. And that's how his leg was preserved. Mark Twain knew him, and I always like to joke that that Sickles, you know, he values, because he would use his leg after the war kind of for political purposes to kind of sell himself as a hero. He lobbied to get himself the Medal of Honor, which he probably didn't deserve. He'd gotten so many men killed by defying the orders of his, of his boss, the general. But Mark Twain met him in later years, you know, knew him in later years and said, yeah, he probably values the leg he lost more than the one he still got, you know, because he would use it to kind of promote himself as a war hero and for political office. And it's kind of a great story. And whiskey is, whiskey kind of wound its way through that whole story. So I use it to tell all these side stories about how whiskey was used and also how whiskey reflected the two different sides. You know, Northern soldiers drink much better than their Southern counterparts. It's, a lot of whiskey was produced in areas that actually are North. Um, and they had better supply lines and logistics for getting whiskey to troops. The South, Southern soldiers were drinking some pretty awful stuff when they were drinking. So another thing that surprised me to learn was that moonshine wasn't born out of prohibition. It had been going on since the Civil War, and it wasn't the backwoods hillbilly we always think of making moonshine either. The hillbilly hoochmaker is our favorite stereotype one that's seen a resurgence in popularity recently with so-called reality shows following modern-day moonshiners as they ply their craft. But it also feeds into it an interesting myth about moonshine and, you know, moonshine culture, which I'll kind of define here as after the Civil War when Lincoln reestablished a whiskey tax. Um, 
you know, taxes on all kinds of spirits, be they imported or domestically manufactured, in order to pay for the Civil War. So that's sort of the birth of the moonshiner. So you know, a lot of people, especially people you know, who have been distilling before, I saw it as their God-given right. You know, like, this is my land, this is something, I mean, you know, like, and taxes weren't, you know, taxation in America was a little bit different. You know, we had a largely invisible, rather small, pre-war federal government, and then we'd go from starting to get a much larger uh, post-war, post-Civil War, large federal government, uh, you know, the bureaucracy was growing bigger and that needed to be fed by money. But you had a lot of moonshiners who were like, wait, I wasn't being taxed on this before. Well, it's not like they're all of a sudden going to just accept that tax. And you know, the war needed to be paid for. And also a tax like that is a good way to limit the drastic, the overconsumption that was happening. I mean, you had a lot of domestic abuse related to whiskey consumption, a lot of really awful byproducts of people's overconsumption. But the idea of the moonshiner as being this rural person, you know, like one strap on their overalls, you know, their mountain hollers was certainly a thing. But urban moonshining was actually in many cases like a much larger issue, a much larger thing, which makes sense because you've got a higher population center. And there's a great book called Chasing the White Dog by Max Watman. And he kind of explores contemporary moonshine culture in his book. And I've spoken to him several times on, on the phone. He's just a really interesting guy. It's a great book. And one of the points he makes is like, well, this is oftentimes urban. And in today's environment, you still have moonshine, but it, it often happens in very economically depressed places in cities. It's really not this mountain image that we have. It's a city image. And that was true in the 1800s. You know, a lot of moonshine was going on in Brooklyn. Okay, so on our timeline, we're now sitting somewhere around 1870, and the evolution of whiskey is at full steam. There are more major distillers or rectifiers, and brands are emerging. But business is cutthroat. And one guy says, hey, look at the oil business. Those guys have the right idea. Let's form a trust and control this thing. We'll keep out all these miscreants, and I'll be rich. Only all this is happening long before the organized crime syndicates that sort of rose to power during Prohibition. Tell me about the Gilded Age of Whiskey and the Whiskey Trust. So I love the Whiskey Trust story because if you look at old beer brands and you go to a ballpark today, you see the, na the names that were getting big, a lot of names that were big in the late 19th century are still big today. You know, the Budweiser's and Anheuser Paps, like the, these beer barons who grew up, you still see their names in ballparks. But the big names in whiskey back then are almost entirely lost. And the names that are big today that are rooted back then, like a, a Jack Daniels or Jim Beam, weren't really big deals in their time. Most of them were relatively very small producers who got big much, much, much later. So I asked myself, well, who are the who are the big wheels back then? And you see the Peoria distillers, guys like Joseph Greenhut. He's met, uh, Greenhut, he was the biggest distiller in America. And he lived in this mansion, I think it was like 33 rooms. Um, Cleveland, you know, President Cleveland had, had visited him here. He loaned his summer residence on the Jersey Shore out to Woodrow Wilson at one point as he used, for use as a summer White House. I mean, he was a big wheel, a lot of money. And he was a rectifier. His distillery, the Great Western Distillery in Peoria, it's still actually functioning as a distillery, but it's owned by Archer Daniels Midland. makes industrial alcohol. It doesn't actually make whiskey. And Peoria produced more whiskey than any other place in America. That one city produced more taxes for federal coffers than any other place around. And you had Distillers Row, which is just this line of mansions. And it's all these names that you know you wouldn't recognize today because there any, any brands attached to them are lost. And a lot of the times these guys actually weren't producing their own brands. They were producing the base spirits that other people would then buy and then brand however they saw that, but they were they were the big volume producers. They were they're industrial. And so Joseph Greenhut, this is the era of trusts before you had a lot of legislation that had broken trusts. You know, trusts were still legal, it's important to, to mention. But you've got standard oil and, and things of that nature. And Joseph Greenhut took a page out of you know their playbook and he tried to basically consolidate the industry. The industry at this time 
we'd have these boom and bust cycles. Prices would be really high, so a lot of people would rush into it. There aren't a lot of barriers to getting into whiskey, you know, the way there are to getting into, say, the oil industry. So they'd rush in. That would create a su surplus. Prices would crater, and all these people would go out of business. And it was very disruptive to the economy. It was a much bigger part of the economy than it is today, and it was spread out all over the country, so it wasn't localized. It was you know, part of a lot of uh, small communities. And so Green Hut tried to establish order by creating this trust, but he would try to force his competitors into his trust, a lot of times with physical violence. If they don't want to join the trust, you throw dynamite into their distillery. And at this time in history, you've got a lot of distillery fires. You're operating stills under high pressure, a lot of fire. So fires are very common, so it's something you could kind of get by insurance agencies. And Green Hut who, an interesting figure, you know, he'd been in the Civil War, he had killed all of these men, he looked very, you know, he had kind of this bulldog's bill, I mean, he was a real, he was a real tough dude. And he starts this trust, and it never really became as successful, obviously, as a standard oil trust, just because, as I said, there are no barriers into whiskey. It was too hard to keep people out. But, you know, he certainly tried, and he did have some limited success, at least for a little, a little while. And it, I use it in the book as a way to describe you know, how the industry was back then and how it was structured, et cetera, et cetera. But then also it was reflective of the politics and the business of the age. And he was a Gilded Age businessman, kind of parks a lot, you know, just would stop at no end. It's very ruthless. So basically this guy, this whiskey trust, is the precursor to the mob. They're using the same tactics, just with less Italians. Right. When you get this blip, too, because of his, you know, and he was part of the reason the industry was seen as, so, you know, kind of a little vile, which, you know, after you have all the legislation that was passed to clean up the industry, there's this blip where the industry started to get clean. You know, it started to improve its image. It actually started to get better. And then all of a sudden you have prohibition, which kind of pushes it right back into this primordial past. You basically made illegal this thing that no one's going to obey, right? I mean, they're still going to drink. And you get these characters that then emerge during Prohibition. You know, the industry, they had a few loopholes written into the law. You could produce a little, you could sell a little bit of whiskey for medicinal purpose, whereas beer was pretty much destroyed in the streets. It's going to go bad. Whiskey, still private property, couldn't destroy it, but the government had it put in these consolidated warehouses, it's washed over by government, you know, revenue agents, washed over by you know, government guards. And you had a lot of siphoning and things like that, but then you still had these permits. You could still sell it medicinally. Um, you still go to your doctor and get a prescription. And you have these businessmen who step in, like George Remus is one of in the book, and then he watches Boardwalk Empire. Notice his character. He's a character who's always referring to himself in the third person. Remus is in it. He had been a trial attorney. He was a very smart guy, kind of a tough kid who'd grown up in the streets of Chicago, an immigrant. And... He had also been a pharmacist. He had an uncle who was a pharmacist. So he went to night school and became a pharmacist at a very young age. He's a trial attorney. He thinks that prohibition is this great hypocrisy, which it kind of was. And he sees these gangsters that he is defending in court just snapping off you know, money in the courtroom to pay their fines, making all this money. And he looks at how dumb a lot of them are, in his opinion. He's like, I, I, I could do this. And he actually has a pharmacy degree. He's like a farmer. And there's this loophole, and he was looking at the law for loopholes. So he starts buying all these shuttered distilleries and all this you know, stock that's under lock and key, and you know he's got some licenses to sell some of it legally. And then you know he's pilfering other parts. He actually bought the Jack Daniel distillery down in Tennessee, and you know replaced a lot of it with water and you know is siphoning it off and he was one of the first great bootleggers um, of that era just made a huge fortune i've got the figures in the books millions and millions of dollars uh, but he does go to prison for a little while and then while he's in prison his wife is conspiring against him i don't want to ruin the rest of the story you know but she's uh you know conspiring against him and he gets out and that all kind of goes south real fast um and by the time you know while he was in prison you know the first great bootlegger then you had that next wave of bootleg guys like al capone and names that have become a little more famous in history kind of come in and take over well now we're really moving along on our timeline 
and were into prohibition, which the liquor industry thought would never actually happen, then it actually did happen, but it isn't working in quite the way that supporters expected. Many of its detractors can still acquire booze through the medicinal use loophole that makes men like Remus rich. But like much of the murky history of bourbon, it's often hard to tell where fact and fiction meet. Organized crime and nefarious gangsters grab headlines for smuggling of booze to speakeasies, but that booze is coming from all kinds of sources, including those protected warehouses that are mysteriously running dry. It seems prohibition has created a lot of opportunities for those smart enough to seize them, and one of the men profiting from prohibition is Henry Ford, because his vehicles could easily be modified to carry booze through the back country and carry it quickly. A few old farm boys used to tinkering with tractors could get a Ford flying, and it wasn't long before men were off racing when they weren't out running moonshine, and this ultimately became the birthplace of NASCAR as we know it today. Prohibition hadn't stopped booze from flowing. It forced men to focus the flow, and that concentrated effort helped a few colorful characters quietly rise to power. And in the aftermath of Prohibition, the fog around obtaining bourbon may have lifted, but the liquor industry itself was still pretty mysterious. What happened in the liquor industry at that point? You had the next wave of liquor industry titans, the men who controlled the U.S. liquor industry for the better part of the rest of the 20th century, like Sam Bronfman, who people know with Seagram, um, or Louis Rosensteel, who owned Shenley Distillers, which doesn't exist today, but, you know, because it's, these, these companies all have been bought and sold so many times and their names have changed, but a big portion of what Rosensteel owned is sort of part of Diageo, which is today, you know, the world's largest liquor company today. Um, Louis Rosensteel, you know, he had started in his uncle's distiller before Prohibition, and then during Prohibition, he did something very similar to Remus, where he's buying all this old stock and he's selling it. Um, and then after Prohibition, they, you know, he along with a few other guys, you know, kind of had this leg up in the industry, and they eventually built these. There are these four companies: the Big Four, Hiram Walker National. Shenley, Seagram, uh, that grew to control about 75% of the entire U.S. market. And, you know, a lot of these guys had, you know, in, in the Cafalver Committee hearings later, you had gangsters like Frank Costello testifying, you know, to their connections to these men. Um, it wasn't until much later when New York State started to investigate ties that legitimate businesses had to organized crime that, Rosa Steele's name really started to, to come out and, and be testified to, or, you know, Meyer Lansky supplier. And so they all kind of had this toe in prohibition, the way a lot of, a lot of people did, um, and organized crime. And you see them create these huge empires and these brands, you know, today that we all kind of know, or that our grandparents all certainly drank, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and you've got the justice department going after them. And it's a very colorful, t and it's a story that, you know, the industry, you know, no one likes to talk about that, obviously. And I had a few people in the industry tell me, well, the Rosensteel, we certainly don't like, in this industry, we don't talk about that guy, you know, because he's not the image you'd put on the, the bottle. But what I was really interested in is, you know, here's a guy who had a mixed reputation for the whiskey he made. I've had some of those old Chenley brands, and like, one of them is probably one of the best whiskeys I've ever had, old Dusty, I've had, yes, one of the great, great stuff. And some of it wasn't so great, you know, because he owns so many outfits. It's got a bad reputation because, you know, it doesn't tug at the heartstrings, his, his the image of this man. You know, he's consolidating the industry. He's putting people out of business. Um, but he's also lobbying. And he's lobbying the government for tax breaks. He's lobbying eventually for that 1964 resolution, which declares bourbon a distinctive product of the United States, which is a trade protection overseas market, but was later reimagined both by the industry itself and by a lot of food writers who you know, love to romanticize bourbon. We all, I, I, you know, it's like it's an easy thing to romanticize as being kind of a Valentine's Day card that Congress bestowed on this product. You know, it's kind of a some, you know, a great symbol of America, but really it was this guy Rosensteel. And I like 
how gray he is as a figure because on one hand, you know, you've got putting people out of business and he's got this connection to organized crime. But on the other hand, he's lobbying for a lot of things like the Frand Act, which extended the amount of time people could age whiskey before they had to pay taxes on it, which gave distillers much more leeway in how they made the product and a little more room to experiment. And he is lobbying for this piece of legend, you know, this congressional resolution, which has helped kind of promote the idea of bourbon as like part of America's heritage, which it really is. And he was doing it, you know, so he would have to compete with foreign people, want, you know, foreign producers wanting to make a product called bourbon, he wanted to give it trade protection. But, you know, it's this kind of mixed record, which I love looking at because you know, on one hand he helped improve it. And on another hand, you know, it was kind of an uglier part of this industry. And when I would bring him up to certain old timers in the industry, I remember one, one person told me, Oh, those guys, Bronfman, Rose Steel, they were just corporate raiders. And I thought about that and I was like, well, if this is like a war and these are like theater commanders, you know, these are Eisenhower, this is Matt MacArthur. And the images that are oftentimes promoted for marketing, you know, the master distillers, and they're certainly important, you know, within their companies. But I almost saw them as, you know, lower level commanders, you know, making big differences, you know, in the, you know, in, in smaller areas. But what you drink today, what you're tasting in the glass, is just as much, if not more, a product of these corporate raiders than of, you know, the figures that we like to romanticize, um, you know, the way that they lobbied for certain changes, those changes affect how the product is made. And so you're very much tasting that. And they created the structure of the industry that at least up to about the year 2005 dominated, you know, just a few companies, I think doing a very good job at what they made, but a relatively narrow selection of products. Um, that's changing today with the, the, the rise of craft distillers. But that's, so you know, to kind of get in those culinary lessons, I use them to pull that history out, you know, like, oh, you know, it's kind of mixed. Because there's such a great story, too, you know, Rosensteel, a lot of people speculate he's one of the reasons J. Edgar Hoover never went after organized crime. It's because he bugged, you know, Rosensteel bugged his offices, he bugged his home, Hoover would go to parties at his house. You know, and they, people suspect he used those for blackmail. Um, he did know Hoover, there's a, you know, his wife at one point testified he'd had a relationship with, with Hoover, or Rosalind Steele was bisexual. Um, she testified in court. She later recanted that and was, you know, found for perjury. Um, but, you know, so it's like a very colorful story. of this guy who had this office in the Empire State Building, wore really nice suits. He had these glasses that kind of remind you of an Atlantic City bookie in the 1970, you know, kind of the yellow amber. He played football in high school, you know, just kind of a real tough businessman um and at one point he owned 50, like about half of all the bourbon in the country <laughs> wow yeah this story just continues to evolve and the characters who surface throughout the book are all engaging and a few like remus and rosensteel are some of the highlights for sure to think that a guy like j edgar hoover was intimidated by rosensteel is a fascinating bit of information but the entire book is like this Revelation after revelation of information we think we already know about these periods of history. At one point earlier, you mentioned how whiskey, or more specifically bourbon, has this kind of patriotic feel about it. And I have to admit, I never really thought about it consciously in that way, but now that I have some context around it, I feel like I've known that all along without quite knowing all the reasons for that feeling. We've talked a lot about whiskey without acknowledging that alcohol, like anything else we consume, is best enjoyed in moderation. Drinking responsibly includes not driving under the influence. Bourbon is something to be shared and enjoyed responsibly among friends. It's not pretentious, and it doesn't have to be expensive, does it? That's something that originally drew me to it in the first place. I remember when I first got into whiskey, it was before whiskey was that, as popular as today, and it was so cheap. You'd go to the liquor store, and I remember these just fantastic deals. Pennies on the dollar for what you might be paying today, and, and these, these kinds of bottles that people lust after today, like Pappy Van Winkle, were always there, covered in dust, not that expensive. And I remember kind of being an advocate for it, like, oh, you know, this stuff, for the quality that it is, 
the fact that it's priced so inexpensively, it's, all, it's such a shame, you know, it's like that's so much better than these wine and all that. And I was always, and now I try not to talk like that because people did kind of catch on and the prices have skyrocketed. But there are still many good bourbons that are reasonably priced. So is it better to just look for a bourbon you like and stick with it than buy something based on hype or price tag? If you just break this stuff down and purely look at it purely from a technical perspective, a lot of rules and a lot of our modern foodie rules are turned totally on their head, completely upside down. You know, big companies actually, whiskey's an industrial product in a lot of ways. So all these big companies make it really well. And their economies of scale actually both help them in some cases, not all, but some, improve quality while bringing the prices down. It's, it's almost the opposite of what you sometimes find. It doesn't have to be, but it, it's very different than beer. And so I love that contrarian truth about whiskey. And, you know, I, I, I use this sort of ideal, though, going back to that older image of whiskey in the book, where I was like, you know, it's, it's humble. It's just whiskey. It's some grains and you turn them in, you know, you, you grind them up, cook them, ferment them, put it in a little barrel and you age, that's all it is. And I love the fact that for years, this really humble product could be made so well and still be so cheap and so accessible to all Americans and such a high, you know, it, it represents an ideal in a lot of ways for, I think, you know, standards for a society to try to achieve, like, you know, we can do it. It's not necessarily for that much money. You know, it can be a great thing that doesn't have to be expensive and is accessible and, you know, it's kind of democratic in that way. So I sort of rail the book a little bit against this fancification. You're seeing all of these new whiskeys coming up that I don't think are quite, are really that good, but their prices are really high because people have been trained to think, well, I have to spend a lot of money for a good product. And, well, no, you you don't, you know, it, 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 you know, so I kind of like pushing against that a little bit to kind of remind people to not always accept those messages they read in the glossy food magazines and things like that. As much as I've been enjoying my own exploration of bourbon, I've learned to let my palate dictate what I like rather than marketing spin and the often bad advice I've received from many well-meaning people. In a way, bourbon is kind of enjoying its golden age right now. What do you think about this alleged craft movement in bourbon right now? Yeah, for your pocketbook and for your sanity, you know, there was a part of I, I I didn't put it in the book, but I was toying with putting it in the book, and it was sort of about the culture that has grown up about whiskey, the idea of connoisseurship, and the people who are educating other people at whiskey, and there are plenty of great educators, brand ambassadors, and writers, and things like that, but I... At one point, I wanted to point out, you know, a lot of these so-called whiskey experts, and you'll see them offering courses on whiskey, or sometimes they'll write an article that you'll find in some obscure corner of the internet, and they present themselves as experts. And, and I didn't get too much into the book, because I think it would have distracted, and it would have been a little bit shaggy from a storytelling perspective, but a lot of times, they their real expertise is convincing other people that they're experts. So walking into a room, and they kind of know just a little bit more than the next guy, and they sometimes give out this, you know, sort of horrible advice, or they're really kind of part of the industry. You know, the, like for instance, ratings. When you see ratings and gold medal and medals and things like that, that really is an industry within an industry. And both of those industries have this sort of symbiotic relationship with each other, where you have, you know, the people doing the metal, and it's not all of them are, you know, rigged. I wouldn't use the word that strong, but some of them are, you know, rigged. <laughs> You know, you've got to pay the company to even be in their, you know, their, 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 their competition. And, you know, then if you do win a medal, which you certainly will, because the medal, you know, you'll see these inflated rating scales, you know, like double gold, gold. So, you know, it's not, it's not, there's nothing that's bad or that would sway customers away. And I was like, field day at an elementary school, right? Everyone's made to look like a winner because that really helps sell the product. Then you have to pay the companies for those little stickers that you do attach to the bottles, you know, in some cases. So it's all kind of like, you know, there's a little bit of this quid pro quo feel where you see the 100 point rating scale, but you never see anything below 80. Like 80 on 100 point scale, you know, it's pretty good. But you've got to always sort of adjust in your head and be like, well, an 80, that's like a, you know, even at, even at 85, that might actually be like a C or a C minus. And yeah, then there's the relative perspective that comes into these things. And they're not 
blind judged too often. You know, I feel like all those rules get turned on their head when you start saying things blind. One of my favorite stories is Maker's Mark. Um, I think it's a fantastic brand. It's made really well, really high. You know, and it used to be a darling of whiskey geeks before it was that popular. Back in the 80s, if you walked into a bar and you ordered Maker's Mark, it was like, oh, this guy knows. You know, this is what a lot of the old timers in Kentucky were telling me. They're like, oh, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. It's, a, it's an esoteric. It's kind of an obscure brand. Whereas today, it's kind of seen as it's ubiquitous, so it's common, so it's not special, and it's not niche. And it's the same to me as a band that becomes big and goes from playing you know, small clubs to big stadiums, and it loses that cool cred that it originally had, even though its music really hasn't changed at all. And that gets back to this other thing with whiskey that I wanted to explore. It's a lot like fashion, you know, it's... The thing in your hand really is almost irrelevant sometimes. You know, hemlines go up, they go down, ties get fat, they get skinny, jeans get baggy, then they get tight again. You know, it's kind of like these arbitrary rules. And whiskey is exactly the same as those things. You know, whiskey at one point was really popular for one set of reasons in America, and then it ceases to be popular in the 60s when boomers turn away from it, favoring drinks like vodka or white wine, you know, wine, things like that. Because um, those were. Vodka was a little subversive. It was meant of Russia. It was the height of the Cold War. It was a way for the boomers to sort of rebel against this older generation. And it had a very cool, it had a coolness attached to it for that. Whiskey was seen, especially bourbon, was seen as fuddy and old fashioned. That's what grandpa drank. And the whole industry just cratered prices. A lot of companies went out of business. There was a lot of consolidation. And now it's cool again. And you've got, you know, partly because of that past, you know, we skip over generations with these things sometimes. So I think when thinking about these brands, I like to a lot of times think of them the same way I think of bands or that I, as I think of fashion styles, they're accessories. And so having these rules in your head about what's better and what's not, you know, they're oftentimes guided not at all by the taste in your mouth, but they're guided by, you know, who's holding it and who's telling you to drink it. And, you know, if you can kind of put aside all of the, you know, that sideshow, so to speak, you're going to be a lot happier. You're going to find all these like undiscovered gems and, you know, just kind of relax and enjoy it. And I felt, and I felt too, though, I didn't try to present that as a, as a negative or a cynical thing. I was like, it's almost refreshing, I think, to understand that or realize that because it allows you to stop listening to all the hype and, you know, reading all the internet commentary and just kind of enjoy what you enjoy and leave it at that and devote the rest of your time to other things that you enjoy. <laughs> Reed, your book has been an absolute pleasure to read. It's full of great insights, stories about historical figures I was often surprised by. And while we covered some highlights in the early history of America's native spirit, we barely even scratched the surface of bourbon's humble beginnings. Reed, thank you again for taking time out of your day to come on our show. It's been great speaking with you and learning about bourbon. I suspect that we could have you on again and again and still have plenty to talk about. Well, thank you very much. Reed's book, Bourbon Empire, The Past and Future of America's Whiskey, is a great study of bourbon from its earliest days to its current stately position. If you enjoy fine bourbon or American history, this book is a must read. It's available wherever books are sold. Hi, this is Cheryl. If you enjoy our podcast, please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. Be sure to support our sponsors, and perhaps consider becoming one yourself. You can visit our website at driftandramble.com for details on how to get in touch with us. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thanks for listening to the Drift and Ramble podcast. Want to grow your business and reach new customers? Whether you're launching a new product, app, book, crowdfunding campaign, or looking to get your existing products and services in front of new potential customers, AdvertiseCast is a great solution.
AdvertiseCast is the first online marketplace that lets you buy ad spots from hundreds of different podcasts and radio shows online. Simply shop listings online and see detailed information about each show. You'll be sure to find shows that work well for your product or service. Give us a shot and try podcast advertising today. For more information, please visit AdvertiseCast.com. Once again, that's AdvertiseCast.com. Hurry, 30-second ad spots are going for just $5. I'd like to thank the Pottern family for welcoming us into the family and for all the help and support from all the other podcasters out there that are part of the Pottern family. How does it work? Simply search the Pottern family hashtag and you'll find hundreds of new podcasts to listen to. Or follow us on Twitter and you'll be introduced to new family members as we discover new podcasts ourselves. You'll find us on Twitter at Drift and Ramble. Or follow us on Facebook at Drift and Ramble. Or visit our website at driftandramble.com. Got a suggestion for the show? Feedback or just want to get in touch? Email us at steve at driftandramble.com. On the next Drift and Ramble podcast, it's almost Halloween. And while you're out buying candy and carving up pumpkins, we have tales of tasty treats and eviscerated beings as we explore the legend of the Wendigo and other weird, wild tales of the West. We'll have some special guests join in the mayhem, and we'll learn what it's like to walk in another man's shoes, or at least wear the shoes made from another man. <laughs> Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West.